Well, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening. We're, we're having people join. The, I can see that people are joining the, uh, the Zoom call. Welcome to this special United Nations Global Compact uh, Academy series uh, on uniting business to respond to COVID-19. I'm Dan Thomas, Chief Communication Officer from the UN Global Compact. We're thrilled that so many of you from around the world continue to tune in each week for our discussions with leaders from business, uh, the United Nations government and civil society. Thank you for joining us from uh, Asia, from Africa, Europe, and the Americas. I've even noted some uh, night owls in Australia are uh, uh, joining as part of our audience. Our conversation today focuses on climate action as a vital response to COVID-19. Just this morning, more than 150 CEOs actually 164 as of today, have signed a statement urging governments to align their COVID-19 economic aid and recovery efforts with the latest climate science. In other words, to reimagine a better future grounded in bold climate action. This statement from companies in the Science-Based Targets Initiative and our Business Ambition for 1.5 campaign is the largest ever UN-backed CEO-led climate advocacy effort to date and has been warmly welcomed by the UN Secretary General. We're posting a link to the statement in the chat box, so please take a look and share it with your audience. And now with us to discuss how climate action can unite business and governments to recover better from COVID-19, I'm pleased to introduce United Nations Assistant Secretary General for Climate Action, Selwyn Hart, he's the Special Advisor to the Secretary General on Climate, the CEO and President of the World Resources Institute, Andrew Steer, Chief Strategy and Sustainability Officer at Orsted, Jakob Askubos, and Mindy Luber, the CEO and President of Ceres, a nonprofit sustainability advocacy organization based in Boston, Massachusetts. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, let me start by asking each of you to very briefly share where in the world you're joining from and what is top of mind for you today in the face of these two interconnected crises, climate change and COVID-19. Uh, Assistant Secretary General, why don't we start with you? Thank you, Dan, and um, good morning. It's morning where I am, I'm in Washington, DC um, in the midst of moving um, to, to New York. Um, and, and first, let me congratulate Global Compact. Um, and um, it's certainly a pleasure to be here with um, Andrew, Jacob, and Mindy um, and to participate in this uh, discussion with folks all over the world. The reality is that without doubt, the most immediate priority in all countries and even um, in businesses is the immediate health crisis. Governments and businesses are operating in crisis management mode um, and countries are really focused right now on, on addressing the immediate health crisis as well as um, limiting the economic fallout. So good leaders will start thinking ahead and many leaders have started to think ahead, but, but great leaders will seek to turn this generation's greatest crisis into a moment of opportunity, transformation, and renewal. And in the coming weeks and months, governments will consider how to stimulate economic growth and accelerate job creation. And they will make some of the most consequential decisions in a generation. These decisions will determine not only the future of humanity, but, on, but the health of the planet. And this is why the Secretary General really has been upfront and very vocal in calling for a green recovery. And, and, and he has proposed six climate positive actions, which we, I'm sure all of you know, um, investing in um, green um, jobs and sustainable sectors, linking bailouts with Paris, uh, 
commitments and alignment, um, ending fossil fuel subsidies, taking climate risk into decision making, working together and also addressing the, the just transition. So we um, have been really working very closely with governments across the world, um, as well as with the private sector to push them towards um, as much as we can push, making the right um, investment and policy decisions around a green recovery that also delivers on the economic growth and job creation um, imperatives. Conversely, if governments um, seek to invest in carbon intensive and carbon pollution, we will accelerate the world's descent into a crisis far worse than today's pandemic. And when we look at the global scorecard in terms of um, how countries are promoting, um, promoting the green recovery in their stimulus packages, it's a very mixed picture. And this is why it's absolutely crucial that initiatives like this um, and actions by the private sector um, help to provide governments with the confidence to make the right decisions and their stimulus packages. On the negative side, we're seeing many countries, many G20 countries roll back environmental protections in the name of jump-started economic growth and job creation. Some have placed climate ambition on pause and we're seeing bailouts to, um, fossil, to the fossil fuel um, industry and other polluting sectors without strings attached. However, on the positive side, we are seeing um, countries impose climate conditionalities on bailouts. Um, for example, Canada, Austria, and France. Yesterday, Spain rolled out a new climate law, a very ambitious climate law. We've also seen a number of leaders and countries, um, such as China and South Korea, publicly support the Secretary General's call for a green recovery, and um, they've aligned themselves with his six climate positive actions. But more importantly, we're seeing real economy actors like yourselves aligning with calls for a green recovery. We've seen the Institutional Investor Group on Climate Change, and Ceres um, played a very vital role in coordinating this initiative, calling for ambition on climate change in the context of the green recovery. So in closing, I just want to thank all of you, um, those that have signed up to this initiative coordinated by our colleagues from Global Con Compact, the 164 um, CEOs representing 33 countries, it is extremely encouraging for us to see the leadership of the private sector and business. We need your voice. We need your influence to support governments to make the right decisions. And you can count on us to continue to be a very strong advocate for ambitious climate action in the context of the COVID recovery. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Andrew, why don't, uh, why don't you tell us, where, where in the world are you joining from? What is top of mind for you today? Well, thanks, uh, Dan, and uh, thanks, uh, Selwyn. Um, what you're doing at UN Global Compact is, is terrific, by the way. And as you say, Selwyn, the, the Secretary General has been a real global leader at this time in terms of... Um, you know, reminding us we have to build back a better. So I'm Andrew Steer, um, the World Resource Institute's an international organization. So most of our staff are in 12 international offices in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and Europe, but I'm based in Washington, DC. Um, what am I worrying about? <laughs> I'm worrying about what this conversation is, is, is all about today. Um, the intuitive response from many policymakers around the world is, my goodness me, it would be great to address climate change, 
But for heaven's sake, we've got more important things to worry about right now. We've got a health crisis. We've got an economic crisis. We need to focus on that. And of course, that's absolutely right. They do need to focus on that. We all need to focus on that. But the way we can actually help focus on that is also by focusing on a recognition that actually the new economics suggests that if you want to restore jobs, if you want to reflate the economy, if you want a more equal world, if you want a more resilient world, you actually do things very differently. You invest in low carbon investments. And there's overwhelming evidence um, out there today that this is true. Smart climate investments lead to more economic efficiency. They lead to new technology and they lead to a reduction in risk. Those three things together create more jobs, more dynamism, more competitiveness, and more growth. So if you want to be a 21st century economist or a 21st century politician, you need to recognize that. The problem is that we haven't done a very good job communicating that. And most politicians and decision makers don't get that yet. And that's what's so wonderful about today, this launch of these 160 odd CEOs of major corporations saying, we get it. We want our governments to get it. So in the coming months, there will be one of the most exciting intellectual battles ever. And that will be about, are we going to build back the same unequal, non-resilient, non-inclusive, high carbon, risky, not very efficient world economy? Or are we going to build back something better? And the stakes are very, very high. So that's what's on my mind. And I suspect yours too. Thank you. Uh, Jak- Jakob, uh, ask your boss from Orsted, where, where are you calling in from today? What's top of mind for you? I'm calling in from uh, Copenhagen and, uh, and, and just following on from the previous remarks, obviously uh, the COVID-19 crisis is, is a, a global crisis that, that needs all the attention uh, possible to, uh, to, to, to address those uh, situations around the world. But at the same time, we're still uh, having the climate crisis and and uh, a global climate emergency, really, we need to have global carbon emissions by by 2030, and then we need to have them again by 2040 to get to net zero by 2050. So we have a monumental task on our hands, and and that will not go away because of of uh, of the the current uh, challenges we are facing. Uh, so. A lot of governments around the world are, are right now considering how to build stimulus packages to uh, to sort of uh, yeah uh, make the economy recover post COVID nineteen and and uh, as a, a a global renewable energy company we we take part in a number of conversations at the moment with governments on the significant opportunities there are for speeding up uh, the global transformation to to green energy. Um, We came out with a report about a month ago here in Denmark uh, demonstrating that it is possible to take the Danish uh, energy sector to almost full carbon neutrality by 2030 uh, using sort of known technologies and and tools. Uh, So it is very much possible to accelerate these um, these investments and this transition, and and it is not it is not uh, something that that will require uh, uh, in ordinary sort of measures uh, in 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 many countries. It's it's about keeping the focus on 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 driving these uh, driving these investments and setting these targets that 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 will continue to 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 drive the, the global decarbonization. Uh, that, that, that's what we're occupied uh, with at the moment. Thank you. We're having a little bit of trouble hearing you. You might want to talk a bit closer to your, your microphone or, or try and sort that out. Um, Mindy Luba, uh, where are you calling in from? What is top of mind for you this morning? Uh, hey, good to see you. Good to see all of you. Uh, I'm calling in from Boston and uh, it's finally a sunny, beautiful day. Uh, What's top of mind is completely consistent with what we just heard from my colleagues. Um, What I hope to talk about today is not only the similarities between the crisis of COVID and climate, and not exactly, and not from a scientific perspective, but the similarities of what systemic shock to our system, our economic system, our planetary system, our public health system, we are learning firsthand this minute 
what it means to have that kind of systemic shock. It is not good, it is not fun, it is not healthy. Climate will bring the same kind of systemic shock, different ways, different forms, but systemic shock it will be. We know it's coming, we need to act as we should have acted earlier on COVID. And as my colleagues have said, there are several ways to go. We could go back to the old ways, or we could go back to charting a new economic future. Either way will get us out of this economic rut that COVID has put us in. Either way is about new jobs. It is about economic breakthroughs. But one way is about a future where our kids have a shot at moving forward, and the other way is not. So part of my discussion today in sharing with my colleagues is how do we get there? What do we need to do? We're all on a lot of webinars. Are we mobilizing? Are we doing what it takes to make sure that the unprecedented, we're going to see 10 to $15 trillion, trillion with a T, not billions, come into our economy and our marketplace, dollars that did not exist three months ago. Nobody was talking about it. They didn't. We've invented that money. So be it. Our treasuries have the ability to do that, and they ought to do it to build us out of this crisis but let's do it in the right way. And if we don't act now, that $10 trillion and maybe more can be spent in the wrong way, which really will be a lock us into a future that is not the future that each of us want to build. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we've seen this extraordinary uh, show of support from the private sector just today, uh, more than 150 CEOs signing that statement. The science-based target initiative, Andrew, is attracting you know, new companies, setting commitments, targets on a weekly basis, regardless of the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. A shift from a gray economy to a green economy seems profitable. Um, tell us, how can companies you know, make the case to governments for urgent and enhanced climate action? Tell us more about the science-based target initiative and what the statement uh, uniting business and governments to recover better uh, today is it aiming to achieve, Andrew. Well, thanks, Dan. Um, it, it is it is a remarkable, quiet revolution that has taken place over the last five years. Um, in the old days, you sort of had this notion that government set environmental policies and companies would sort of you know follow somewhat reluctantly. I don't know if that was ever true, but it certainly isn't true now. The Science-Based Targets Initiative came into being about five years ago at the time of, uh, the time of Paris. Um, there now are 860 major corporations that have signed up saying, we are going to be transparent about how we report our greenhouse gases, and we're going to have targets to decarbonize throughout our entire supply chain over the coming three to four decades. Um, and each year, we're going to be very transparent, it's, uh, and we're going to invite four organizations um, that's uh, UN Global Compact, CDP, WWF, and uh, WRI, World Resource Institute, which I represent. Um, we're gonna ask these, uh, these uh, organizations that are very trusted to, to sort of hold us accountable, to sort of set the rules and so on. Now, originally that was for a two degree, now it's for a 1.5 degree world. And so for companies, even that are committed to two degrees now to up their game to say, we're actually consistent with science to generate real decarbonization, the net zero by the middle of the century, very remarkable thing. So these companies now, remember they have what's called scope one, two, and three. Scope one is looking after your carbon emissions within your own bounds. Scope two is where do you get your electricity from? That has to be green too. Scope three is much more complicated. It's the whole supply chains, where you buy from and so on. That's a more difficult one. So this is a remarkable process ongoing. Um, and so what's happening today now is that some of these companies, a growing number, and today 155, are saying, for heaven's sake, we've set targets. We need, uh, if you like, the enabling environment. We need governments now to set the same targets. Some governments have, but many have not. And so the question is, how can these companies actually influence governments? Um, well, the good news is that governments tend to listen to their private sector, especially at a time like this, where they want more jobs and so on. And so the voice of the private sector right now is very powerful in, in halls of power. And by the way, it's not just, it's not just uh, corporations that produce you know, manufactured goods. Mindy's here, it's, it's financial uh, institutions, 
It's all kinds of a broad array. So, so one way is that, um, and, and bringing evidence to bear. You know, talk, I've been with several CEOs to talk to senators here in the United States, and they say, my goodness me, it's obvious you would expect someone like me from an environmental NGO to advocate, but why would the CEO of a, of a heavy manufacturing company come and persuade us that actually a price on carbon or carbon tax is a good idea? Well, of course, the answer is that will enable a different future, a future that's actually going to be much better for the corporate yeah. sector. There's another way that yeah. the, the corporations need to operate. They need to engage with their business associations much more. Business associations yeah. generally have been behind the curve, certainly in this country, in the United States. Um, and, and corporations need to say, if, if you want us to be members, you've got to come into the 21st century. It's wonderful to see like the International Chamber of Commerce that's doing that. Obviously, the UN Global Compact has always done that. But what about the other chambers of commerce and so on? They're way behind the curve. That's the second one. A third way, which is very, very powerful, is that corporations can say to governments and to utilities, look, we would love to invest a billion dollars in your state. But actually, if you want us to do that, because we have commitments to green our activities, you need to provide us green energy. So if you look in the United States, you will find that some of the most um, uh, unexpected states, some of whom don't really seem to even believe in climate change, have some of the most innovative policies on renewable energy. Why? Because major corporations, the Facebooks, the Googles and others have said, yeah, we'd be delighted to put a server, you know, spend several hundred million dollars in your state, but you have to generate for us green electrons. So that's using a little more muscle. That's happening, by the way, in India. It's happening in countries like Vietnam. Quite exciting to see that more muscular approach. Yeah, thank you. And just uh, just remind us that the Science Based Targets Initiative, that is open for, for all companies. So companies that haven't yet joined or haven't started to think about setting setting their own uh, targets as a business, they can, they can do that and get help to do that, right? Well, absolutely. And, and so far, it's been more large and middle uh, sized companies, but now it's being open to small companies, too. And so, yeah, there is assistance to be provided, technical assistance, because these things are quite complicated. Um, and each of the four institutions that are sort of overseeing this, they all have very different skills. And so each of, uh, each of us brings something to the company. Absolutely right. Please, please um, join if you, are, if you are, are, are working for a company and are not yet a member. It'd be great. And by the way, adding up these 860, now if you look at their total emissions, it's over five gigatons. Think about that. That's more than 10% of total global emissions. Uh, it's, a, it's a remarkable thing how quickly this is happening. We're, we're thrilled and we now need to really use this to, to really get systemic change. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Jakob, your company, Orsted, is the, the largest energy company in Denmark. You're a global company. Uh, also ranked this year as the world's most sustainable company in the corporate Knights Index. And your CEO has signed this statement, uniting business and governments to recover better. Um, why is Orsted so ambitious? What is the role of private sector companies like yours uh, in taking on this kind of uh, climate ambition and leadership? Well, because we are facing a, a major global crisis, uh, which really requires that we transform the world's uh, energy systems from, from black to green energy. Uh, I mean, almost three quarters of all the CO2 that, that, that is the challenge for the world comes from the global energy system in, in, in one form or another. So we really need to, to decarbonize and, and green uh, that whole system in order to, to, to solve the challenge of, of climate change. And, and, and our support for, for the science-based initiative is, is very strong. And, and, and it is so for a very simple reason, because we have a very tangible task at hand. We need to get to net zero by 2050. And the only way we'll know if we get there in time is if we sort of measure up our plans against what science is telling us. Uh, so so if, you, if we want to be credible as a company, we need to set targets that are sufficiently ambitious uh, and make sure that, that they align with what science is telling us. In, in us that we've said that we want to become 
uh, carbon neutral in scope one and two by two, uh, 2025 uh, and, and uh, fully carbon neutral, including scope three in 2040. And, and, and those kinds of targets are, are needed if, if we are to, to drive this, uh, drive this uh, transformation on a, on a global scale. What, uh, what words of encouragement would you give to other companies thinking about, uh, you know, being equally ambitious? I mean, how hard is it? How hard is it for an energy company like Orsted to do this? Uh, what does it require in terms of willpower and, uh, and strategy? Well, I mean, 10 years ago, we were one of the most fossil fuel intensive energy companies in Europe. Our core business was in oil and coal and natural gas. But we decided to change because we could see that we would not be successful long term if we kept on sort of uh, delivering energy through fossil fuels. And, and today we have, uh, we have improved our performance significantly. We tr completely transformed. We, as you mentioned, we are, we are, we've been named the most sustainable company in the world. Uh, Ten years after, we were one of the most fossil fuel intensive companies. And along with that, has, has, there's been tremendous business success. We've significantly improved our financial financial performance, we're now a global company. So, so for us, I mean, if we had stayed in the past of, of fossil fuels, we would probably have been dead by now. Uh, so, so it has really been a transformation that has, has been needed for us to, to, to make sure that we were sort of part of the future uh, uh, business uh, success, if, if you will. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Assistant Secretary General Selwyn Hart, you've been appointed by the Secretary General to help deliver ambitious climate action globally. Um, tell us, you know, what does climate leadership look like in the face of this COVID-19 pandemic? And, and how, um, you know, these, these, these companies, they're asking uh, governments to set a level playing field so that they can equally uh, be ambitious around climate. Uh, you know, how hard is it to, uh, to get governments to give them that level playing field? Thank you, Dan. And um, to to pick up on something that Jakob um, just just upset. Uh, the reality is that the shift from the green um, from the gray or the brown to the green economy has already started, right? And smart businesses realize that this shift is inevitable because it is driven by the simple logic of human survival. Those who move quickly and first. Um, um, are stronger and will reap the biggest com competitive advantages. Those who delay will see the biggest cost. Five years ago, in the lead up to Paris, and Dan, you were part of that effort, um, we heard loud and clear from the business community that they needed certainty on the direction of travel. And that helped to motivate governments to be ambitious in agreeing on the Paris Agreement, um, which set um, um, these long-term um, temperature goals. And what we saw as a result um, of the Paris Agreement was this global movement that you spoke about earlier. Um, in less than a decade, we've seen the cost of large-scale wind farms declined by 40% um, in the United States. The cost of solar PV by about 70 to 80%. And we've seen um, significant advances in battery storage that um, places on the cost of um, a major revolution in, um, in energy sources, um, um, storage. So we are seeing movement. Um, and therefore, this is why the Secretary General has been, um, has tasked us with the responsibility of not only um, working with governments, but also mobilizing key actors in the real economy who don't like uncertainty and risk. And um, we saw this last year again with the Secretary General's um, Climate Summit. So um, we, while we're targeted um, primarily uh, in the G20, 
we want this to be a global movement, a truly global movement. We want to ensure that climate ambition um, and the recovery are embedded in the stimulus and recovery packages, not only of the G20 countries, we definitely need it in the G20 countries, but we also want it to be a global movement. Today's minor emitters or tomorrow's major emitters. So in addition to working with G20 countries, the Secretary General um, has also tasked us with the responsibility of working with the smaller vulnerable countries um, to ensure that this green recovery is also embedded in their own um, recovery strategies as well. Uh, so this leadership and commitment from the private sector is absolutely key. However, governments as Andrew and Jacob stated before must provide clarity on the direction of travel. Thank, thank, thank you, Selwyn. And it's not just uh, it's not just the the businesses, the shareholders, the stakeholders who are who are calling for this change. It's also uh, you know large parts of society. It's the it's the customers. It's the younger generation. I guess you're you're also keen to mobilize, as you said, this global global movement. There's there's uh, millions of young people out there also demanding this this change, Selwyn. Yes, um, Dan, you are right. And young people are the key, right? While the economic harm of the COVID crisis has hit many young people hard, the broader trend um, is that young people are becoming the world's largest consumer group. And they're also voting with their purses and their wallets. And, and, and they are also telling us, and, and, and you've seen all the various youth movements, youth movements all over the world that they will work for and invest in, in companies that promote um, sustainability, that promote um, um, ambitious climate action. And we've also seen that companies that like, like um, Jacob's company, um, they, those companies that have higher sustainability ratings tend to outperform their peers. Um, and um, and it, it's, it's um, crucial that as we move into this phase of recovery, that we highlight and showcase those early movers, those companies that are doing the right thing, those governments that have put the right policy frameworks in place. And, and, and this is definitely a priority for us as we move into our work over the course of the next few weeks and months. Thank you. Uh, Mindy Luber, last week you hosted the largest mobilization of American and multinational companies and investors to call on US congressional lawmakers on both sides of the aisle to take climate action as part of the economic uh, recovery process. Um, what did the companies ask for and why is now the time for business leaders to engage in this kind of policy advocacy? Mindy, I think you're on, on mute. We can't hear you. Maybe you can unmute yourself. Okay, great. I Apologies. I'm putting it in context. Yes, we had about 350 companies, so I'm going to come back to that. What we have right now is a moment in time. I, I think we've all talked about the fact that the world needs to move towards a net zero 1.5 degree world, unquestionably. There is progress. Private sector is understanding and learning that this kind of systemic shock to the system from a COVID or a climate um, is not something they want to see. And they're getting more involved for all the reasons we heard, because the people who work for companies want to work for a value-driven company, because consumers want to shop at a value-driven company, and because investors are demanding the companies become more focused on the real risks of the economy. So we know we've got to move all sectors. In the end, moving company by company, investor by investor, 
won't be quickly enough. We need to frame all of this and we need a global policy uh, beyond the Paris Agreement, which is still our holy grail, whether or not the US is in or out, that's the Northern Light. Um, and we've got to push towards that and push everybody towards that. Beyond that, there's not an easy global policy effort. It's country by country, and then even below that, state by state. But we need that level playing field. Rather than moving 200 companies or 300 companies, we need to move 2,000, 3,000. So having a focus on both individual company movement, financial company movement, but policy is crucial. We need a level playing field. We need a set of rules that applies to everybody. In the United States, it's no different, sometimes more complicated. I'm not sure we absorb and understand the issues of climate the way some of our colleagues in other countries do. Uh, but what we tried to do last week, because there is so much focus on moving trillions of dollars of stimulus money, now, literally this week, next week, next month, the next three months, how do we get in there and make sure that money is moved in the right direction and not the wrong direction? And those kinds of dollars, trillions are being moved around the world. And we really do have those two options that I mentioned before, an option that will move us backwards to a fossil fuel future, unheard of, unacceptable, or an option that moves us to the kind of future Selwyn was talking about. Uh, we started talking to companies about coming to Congress, obviously before our shutdown. Um, after the shutdown, we said, uh, we're going anyway. And we had about 345 companies from Salesforce to Dow to Eileen Fisher to Visa to Microsoft complicated companies like Lafarge, Tiffany, Nestle's, companies that literally put their name on the line, joined us for 85 meetings with members of Congress. Yes, they were virtual meetings and maybe that was even better, um, but they were very vivid and clear. Members of Congress came, not just their staffs. We met with people with R's after their name, meaning Republicans as well as Democrats to talk about the essential necessity of making sure these trillions of dollars that are moving out the door now, stimulus packages are being passed every single day, focus on building back better, as Andrew said, and it couldn't be more appropriate. We need to build mass transit and not necessarily more highways. We need to use clean steel and clean cement or cleaner and less toxic than the old ways. We need to make sure that EV charging stations line our highways when we have highways. The list goes on and on, and this is our moment in time. And what we heard from each of these companies, as well as 400 of our investors who separately have been lobbying their members of Congress, is that there is an openness to this now, um, but we, we've got to get in there at this minute. We're talking about no more subsidies for the fossil fuel industry, which have had subsidies for 50 years, at least. If we're gonna have subsidies for the energy field, it should be for the obvious, wind um, and solar. And the key point here is we want as badly as anyone to jumpstart our economy. What we're seeing is devastating. We yeah. could do it in one of two ways. Clean energy creates as many jobs as dirty energy using cleaner products and cleaner equipment creates as many jobs as dirtier. It is not about jumpstarting our economy. We are all ready, we're ready and rearing to go, but we've got to do it in the right direction. So my overall message is, and we all say there's never been a time like today, I'm gonna to say there's never been a time like today. And the reason being, that the money is being spent today. The COVID situation created an opportunity where there's trillions of dollars, again, unprecedented amounts of money going into the economy. It'll go one way or the other. And every one of us on this webinar, and thank you for hosting it, every company, every individual needs to weigh in and make sure those dollars are not spent in a way that sets us backwards where we can't recover as it relates to climate but takes us forward to jobs, to clean energy, to jumpstarting our economy, but to having an impact on the climate crisis today. Um, and that's our job. We need to get off of the webinar and get on the phones and be talking with our companies, 
our investors, our lawmakers, and making the case that we are so far from climate being an environmental issue. It is an environmental, a public health, a human well being, an equity, and an economic issue of the first order. Um, and get it out of this ghetto of only environmentalist care or students who are picketing in Europe care. We all need to care. We all learned just now what it's like to be in a crisis. Let's head off that next crisis. Thank you. And as, uh, as uh, the Assistant Secretary General said earlier, this is a crisis, uh, the climate crisis is potentially going to be far worse than today's pandemic crisis. So let's, uh, let's just try and get you to answer before you jump off and go to work uh, to do that. Let's, uh, let's have a few questions from the audience. One question uh, which maybe you, Andrew, can have a go at answering, and then uh, I'd like to ask uh, Yakov. What can employees do, uh, people who work for companies, what can they do to mobilize the kind of climate leadership that we're needing? Andrew. Well, one of the reasons that um, so many companies are taking this serious now is because of their employees. Um, I've had several CEOs from um, companies that are behind the curve um, uh, saying, basically, um, we're finding it more difficult to attract uh, the best young people now. Um, and, and some companies now uh, have benchmarks. They look at sort of some of those companies that have done the best, the kind of, you know, Unilever type companies that actually, you know, you can, you can see the caliber of young people they're able to attract. And, and so I, I know some companies that are basically saying, we want to come up to that level. And, and you can't just do it through PR <laughs> because these, these young people are smart. They will know exactly how good you are. So um, what can young people do? Um, good companies today are more flat structured. They are more open to internal dialogue. And so young people, not only young people, but employees need to say, we own this company as much as the shareholders do. We are giving you know, uh, the best years of our lives to the, these companies. And we are going to you know, push and push and push so that our companies become modern and efficient and by the way, more profitable if they do it right. You know, I mean, uh, and it, it's truly remarkable what's happened in terms of, if you look at uh, companies that have high ESG, environment, social governance, they are on average doing better in terms of profits and, and shareholder prices than those that are behind the curve. Jakob, uh, thank you, Andrew. Jakob, uh, what's your experience in, in Orsted? Is this something that's being driven top down by your company leadership or, or is it really, you know, all your staff engaged in, in driving this, uh, this transformation? This is very much a vision and, and, uh, and an engagement which is driven across the, the company. You know, our, our vision is uh, to help create a world that runs entirely on green energy. And that's a, a very sort of simple message, but on the other hand, a very challenging one because 80% of the world is running on, on fossil fuels still. So, so we have a long way to go, but our staff is incredibly motivated to be part of this journey. Our employee satisfaction has never been higher in the company and, and everybody is, is, is sort of truly passionate about about this and, and I would just echo what, what Andrew says about recruiting talent. Uh, I mean, th this is this is a, a purpose and a cause that people want to join. Uh, so also from that perspective. And then coming back to, to the question, what can employees do? Well, one of the things that, that we're actually uh, doing is we're, we're having a, a conversation with, with, with our pension uh, uh, savings uh, providers on how do they actually invest their money. And that's actually a quite tangible thing where you can right. go in and say, well, what what criteria, what, what global uh, policies are you actually signing up to? Um, the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance is a fantastic initiative, which is bringing together some of the largest uh, uh, capital holders of, of the world. And they have committed to drive their portfolios to, to net zero by, by 2050. That's a conversation that people ought to be having with their pension provider and saying, why don't you join this great initiative? Thank you. Um, Assistant Secretary General uh, Selwyn Hart, I mean, here's a question from the audience. Um, you know, we've seen this extraordinary call, uh, this statement from, from 164 CEOs this morning. Um, do you think, um, do you think 
uh, the private sector can really influence governments to protect, you know, the multilateral system to ease uh, the international recovery. Do you think governments are really open to this kind of uh, this pressure and this level of ambition that's coming at them from private sector companies and CEOs? Um, definitely, Dan. Um, and we've seen it before. Um, we saw it five years ago um, with the Paris Agreement. Um, we saw it last year with the Secretary General's Climate Summit. Um, and um, one of the negative aspects of the crisis has been this very inward focus by, by national governments. And, and um, as a result, um, uh, governments have not, many governments um, have, have not been cooperating um, with each other in a way that would assist us in helping to mitigate some of the worst impacts of this crisis. Right. However, we've sort of seen the inverse from, from the private sector. Uh, statements like today's statement, um, which transcends national borders and regions, um, statements like the, um, like the uh, uh, recent statement um, from the um, Investor Alliance, which again transcended national borders and um, regions, demonstrate that in addition to calling for ambitious climate action, um, the private sector recognizes the value of enhanced multilateral and international cooperation and collaboration. We cannot solve global challenges um, without finding global solutions and, and, and cooperating both across national governments, but also with the private sector. So I think an important lesson that the private sector can also um, um, present to governments is the need for enhanced collaboration and cooperation um, across national borders. Many of the corporations that are part of this statement um, don't only operate in one jurisdiction, they operate around the world. And they have a vested interest in governments not only taking ambitious action at home, but also working with um, other governments to ensure uh, that this transformation is truly, truly a global transformation. And the final point is, um, this is a once in a generation crisis. And I believe that we have a once in a generation opportunity to transform the, the global economy. Um, and Mendy is right, you know, three months ago, if anyone had said that, you know, 10 to 15 trillion um, in new money will be injected in the global economy, we would have been laughed out of the room, right? Um, but we have this um, major financial injection into the global economy. We also have the solutions at hand. We also have the solutions at hand. Um, renewable energy is, um, is, is um, cost competitive in most major economies. Um, record low um, um, fossil fuel prices provides us with the opportunity to significantly reform fossil fuel subsidies and to put a price on carbon. So we have this arsenal of, of perfect arsenal of finance, um, as well as policy and technological options and solutions to support this transformation that everyone um, around this table this morning um, is agreed that we need to do, and we need to do it fast. Thank you, thank you. And uh, Mindy, uh, finally to you, you've, uh, you've, you've, you've reflected on this need. I mean, we've got to get off this call and get to work to get this action going. What's your advice? I mean, you're doing this very successfully in the United States. Um, what's your advice to other countries? How can business leaders influence their governments? Uh, what kind of advocacy do they need to do today and in the week to come? Uh, to really get this shift going and, and to make this uh, transition and to make it fast? Well, the first thing I would say before the how is business 
and financial leaders are disproportionately um, powerful in their voice right now. Now, that shouldn't be the case. Every citizen should have equal power to every corporate leader. But hearing the voice of corporate leaders and investors does move the narrative. It takes it out of the ghetto of environmentalism into the discussion of finance um, and jobs. So the first thing is we're on to something here. Everybody here right. talking about moving private sector leaders, their voices disproportionately heard, let's take advantage of it because they do care. So it should be, they need to be out there just like today's letter um, on science-based targets, like the 350 companies we had in Congress. It changes the message when the messengers change. So let's broaden that group of messengers, the army of people making the case. Um, and then it's getting to the right people in the right power base in the United States it's not only the United States Congress, although that's where the trillions of dollars will be moved out of, it's state legislatures. And again, our state legislatures care more about what their businesses in their districts think, because it's about jobs for their constituency. So let's tie all of this to the economy of our respective worlds. Um, we've, got, we've got a tapestry, it's called the Paris Agreement. Every country, with a few exceptions, and I'm embarrassed to say my country doesn't know where it's at right now, uh, that will change, I'm convinced. Um, but every country has that North Star. And I think business leaders need to be getting to their members of parliament, Congress, European commissions, um, to make sure this message is getting out because the money is moving out the door as we speak. Well, there's the, a very clear message there. We've heard about the, uh, this remarkable, uh, you know, quiet revolution that we've been on and the, uh, the importance of, uh, you know, really taking advantage of this, this moment in time. And we've seen that extraordinary letter. We've put the link in the chat. Uh, the Science-Based Target Initiative is there to help companies to take their own steps, to be part of a wider group uh, calling for this uh, ambitious climate ambition and action needed right now. Um, thank you to our speakers, Mindy Luba, Selwyn Hart, the Assistant Secretary General, Jakob Askubos, Andrew Steer. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to our audience for joining us today. Uh, uh, we've launched this statement on uniting business and governments to recover better. Uh, the documents uh, accessible via the link in the chat box, as I said. Um, to our audience, I hope you'll register for next week's session uh, which will be held in collaboration with the International Chamber of Commerce and focus on helping small businesses to, to survive and recover better from COVID-19. We've got a great lineup of speakers, including John Denton, the Secretary General of the ICC, uh, Peter Indegwa, the CEO of Safaricom, uh, Mataza Ahmed from uh, Artistic Milliners in Pakistan, and Dorothy Tembo, the exact acting uh, executive director from the International Trade Center. Uh, that session will take place next Tuesday, May the 26th, at the earlier time of 8 o'clock uh, Central European time, so that our colleagues in East Asia and the Pacific region can join more easily. And of course, please do register for the UN Global Compact Leaders Summit, taking place virtually online on the 15th and 16th of June, uh, where amongst other topics, we'll be continuing this conversation about climate action and ambition as part of a, a better recovery with Nigel Topping, Patricia Espinoza, Sharon Burrow, and uh, Jose Manuel Anta Canales, as well as the president of Costa Rica. So thank you so much for participating and we'll see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>